We Raided the Wrong Tomb by Joshua Wagner Hello listeners, I'm glad to see you all here again in this little world of mine. But before we begin this particular story, I'd like to take a brief moment to talk about memory. If I were to ask you all right now, which colors are the Google letters and what order they're in, would you be able to tell me? If I were to ask you to repeat verbatim, the very last thing your best friend said to you in person, could you? Or what about everything they said throughout the course of a day? Or better yet, if I were to show you a particular task once, only once, would you be able to describe it in perfect detail? Most of us already know how bad memory really is, but we listen to these stories with the assumption that everything we hear is exactly how it happened for the protagonist. But is it really? And we assume that the protagonist is being completely honest with us as well. But are they? Is the information they give us always accurate? Might that be because they didn't know? Or because they themselves were misinformed? Can errors and incongruity be deliberate elements of a story? I say they can. This particular story was written with that idea in mind. So I invite you all to pay extra close attention to this one, and try to find things that don't quite add up. And then, perhaps even consider this in relation to the rest of the stories in this universe. Perhaps that might slightly change your perception of the characters and the story itself knowing that you can't always trust what you're being told. I primarily wrote mystery and detective stories before switching to this genre, so the idea of less than obvious plot elements is firmly rooted in my writing. The closer you listen, the more the stories unfold. Anyway, thanks for humoring me. I'll let Temper take it from here. Ever since I was young, I've been positively obsessed with things like Indiana Jones, Tomb Raider, National Treasure, Anything that has the action hero archaeologist types in them. Even into adulthood, I was well convinced that archaeology had to be one of the most exciting jobs possible. It just had to be a life of dodging booby traps and fighting off bandits looking to sell rare artifacts to the highest bidder. It wasn't until I was in university and began the hands-on, in-field portion of my education when I realized that the field might have been oversold in the movies. This was further cemented once I graduated and was brought on by a museum in the US, which shall remain nameless. I was disheartened to learn that most archaeological work was little more than cataloging boxes on top of boxes on top of boxes of more people's discoveries from decades ago. What a damn kick to the teeth that was. I was practically a cave troll after a year or two. You cannot imagine the boredom. My salvation came in the form of a friend and colleague bursting through the door to the archive, where I'd been examining fibres of an old shoe. Jesus, Sandy, you almost gave me a heart attack! I exclaimed, slowly sitting on the stool next to the table. Sorry, Beck, but you're gonna shit when you see this! She yelled excitedly and practically hopped over to where I was recovering from my startle. Look, look! She insisted, shoving several printed photos under my nose. Okay, okay, what am I looking at? Look! She yelled again, pointing to sections of the images. So I inspected them more closely. They looked to be mostly of partially burnt forest, but I was able to make out what appeared to be a very large rectangular stone tablet under some of the debris. It looked to be quite large, in fact, more than two meters tall and at least one and a half wide. There also looked to be some carvings along the length of it. Looks like an old tablet. I said dismissively, handing the pictures back to her. So what? Terry just took these in Peru. The fires burned away a lot of the foliage that was hiding this thing. She exclaimed. Okay, so it's Norte Chico. They're all over the place. I concluded. Wait. They didn't do art. I thought out loud, taking back the photos and looking over them again. So, Chaven... That's like 900-ish to 200-ish BC, right? Fits the time and area. Yeah, I know, but here's the kicker. Terry said that the perimeter on the left shows signs of wear and indicates some kind of hinging activity. Beck, it's not a tablet. It's a door. She told me with a glimmer of excitement in her big brown eyes. That is pretty amazing. 
But what do you want me to do about it? I asked. We need to go investigate! She screamed. If we wait, then someone else will get to it. Terry's waiting for us in Cusco right now to lead us back to the site. But we have to hurry. Hurry? You don't hurry something like this, Sandy. We would need passports and preparation vaccinations and all kinds of stuff. We don't even do field work. We're lab rats. You know that. Besides, Terry's a spaz anyway. I added, thinking back to incidents like when he wore a 1,000-year-old ceremonial fertility mask to a Halloween party to help his chances of getting laid. What? Are you serious? Where did your Tomb Raider spirit go? This could be the archaeological find of the decade, if not even a century. And you don't want to be a part of that. She scolded in return. Besides, Terry knows a guy with a cargo plane who makes trips back and forth to Peru all the time. He can get us in. All we have to do is pack a bag. I'll think about it. I told her before resealing the shoe fibers I had been working on and placing them back on the shelves. I'll let you know tomorrow morning. Later that night, I found myself in front of the mirror in the expedition clothes I had bought some years ago, never used even once. I thought back to old daydreams of being chased by gigantic boulders and swinging over pits of snakes whilst cradling some long-lost ancient idol. Or ones where I was facing down bandits on a rickety bridge over a roaring river. Then I started rummaging through my backpack. I found some things I remembered, and others I had forgotten all about. Glow sticks, magnesium flares, LED flashlight, spare batteries, now out of date. MREs, still way in date. Foil space blanket, medical kit, copper water bottle, butterfly knife I bought after seeing Lara Croft use one in a movie, regular knife I bought after seeing that I couldn't flip one around like Angelina Jolie did in a movie. I looked over each item as I removed them from the bag. Then I found the small .38 revolver I'd tucked away in there. I thought about getting a pair of automatic pistols, but then I realized at a shooting range that it's really hard to hold, aim, and fire two at the same time, and even harder to reload. Also, they're really expensive and buying all this stuff had me short on money at the time. Back then, I was getting ready for an actual adventure. One that I was now looking for any excuse to get out of. And that was that. I decided right then that I would go. After all, I might never get another opportunity like this again. I crammed everything back into my pack and texted Sandy. The next day we were both standing next to a dilapidated cargo plane. Bags slung over our shoulders. So, it's Peru, is it? A voice called from behind, causing us both to flinch. We both turned to face the voice. Um, yeah, th that... I mean, yes, Peru, I said, trying to sound as tough and confident as possible, puffing up my chest to seem bigger. And we gotta go as soon as we can, I said to the middle-aged man I assumed to be the pilot. Nice rack, I hear the man say as I look down to see his face a few inches away from a chest. What? Ew! I yelled backing away and almost tripping over the steps leading up to the plane. The pilot laughed as he ascended the steps, motioning for us to follow. His antics lasted the entire flight down to the west coast, which was not a short one. These included him using the intercom to announce things such as, Ladies and gentlemen, I just hung my pecker out of the plane. If you look to your left, you'll be able to see it flopping just outside your window right now. Please, no flash photography. He was definitely Terry's friend. As we neared our destination, we heard static over the intercom once again and cringed in anticipation of whatever foul joke he was about to make. But instead, he began to speak in a serious tone. Right, we're landing in a few minutes. Once we touch down, you're gonna want to lift up that panel towards the back right corner and crawl in. And don't come out until I say so. They're likely gonna search the cargo hold. And you can't exit the plane until night when you won't be seen leaving. Otherwise, it's all our arses. The next time he spoke was to signal us into the hatch. He waited inside the dark, cramped space for several minutes, listening to footsteps thump against the metal floor over us. Then several more passed after the movement stopped. Light broke through as the pilot removed the panel to let us out. Okay, you still have a couple of hours before it's dark enough to leave. Strap poker, anyone? Yes, protruding a deck of cards. 
After the sun set, we made our way out from the plane and were taken by the pilot to a small motel on the outskirts of Cusco, where we were to wait for Terry to arrive the next day to lead us to the site. The pilot had set up the room before he left the country to pick us up. It was paid off for several days and had been fully stocked with food in accordance to Terry's instructions. Say what you will, but the man can plan. What do you think all the aspirin's for? I asked Sandy as I sorted through the things left in the room for us. The question answered itself before long. Oh my god, I want to die! I screamed as I rocked back and forth on the bed, one hand clutching my head and the other over my mouth as I tried to choke down another two aspirin pills. What the hell is wrong with me? A few hours after we settled in, my head began to spin and I started to feel like I could vomit at any second. And then my head just started pounding. I managed to pull my head out of the toilet for a brief moment when I heard the room door open and Terry enter. Beck's real sick, Sunny exclaimed as she rushed over to Terry, pulling him over to me. They've been like this for hours. Are they going to be okay? Yeah, altitude sickness isn't supposed to be fun, he stated with a chuckle. You're 11,000 feet above sea level. Your body wasn't able to acclimate to the changes in pressure fast enough and now you have acute mountain sickness. Should go away before long, he explained over the sounds of me throwing up. We waited another day for the altitude sickness to wear off before starting our trip to the Amazon. That morning we all piled into Terry's jeep and got underway. We rode all the way until we had absolutely no road left to drive over. We then disembarked on foot and began to hike the long trail through the rainforest. It didn't take long before I regretted wearing short shorts. The thorny bush hacked and soared away mercilessly at my legs, causing hundreds of bloody beads to speckle my pale skin. We walked for hours and hours. Then I started noticing an odour. Oh my god, what is that stink? I asked, trying not to gag. That's you. Terry answered plainly, but with a grin. That's not me! Your shirt's cotton. The humidity in the air won't let your sweat evaporate fast enough, and your shirt's starting to putrefy with it. Your shirt is rotting in your body funk. He chuckled. Ugh! Why did nobody tell me that would happen? The experience helps you remember to not do it again. We'll camp here. There's a stream where you can wash it off in and hang your shirt up to dry off a little. How much longer... I asked about an hour and a half after we packed up and left camp the next morning. Another day, more or less, Terry replied. I almost broke down into tears when he pointed out that this was just one way, and that we would also have to walk the same distance back. I wanted to flop onto the ground and be carried back to the motel. Bugs, thorns, heat, smell. I was starting to think adventure stories had admitted certain crucial details of the adventure experience. But my spirit was greatly lifted once we heard the announcement from Terry. I'd been chatting with Sandy a few meters behind when we heard him shout back to us. Almost there, guys! Just over this hill! We both sprinted ahead of him to get our first glimpse of the structure. As our heads crested over the hill, there it was. We clambered the rest of the way over in excitement, practically crawling over each other. We rushed up to the large stone and began inspecting it coming over every detail. We were here. This was it. It was ours. Beck, look at this, Sandy instructed, motioning me in her direction. A lot of the carvings were scratched off. There's only bits and pieces left. This one looks like a group of men with... bars of some kind? Metal lingots, maybe. But that wouldn't line up with our current records. Neither do the giant hinged doors, I added. All right, Mr. Door, we can do this the easy way or the hard way, Terry stated, walking up behind us with a crowbar and what looked like... explosives. Are you seriously going to blow it open? Sandy yelled at him. Not if Mr. Door cooperates with me, I won't, he said with his usual grin. But I am going to see what's in there this time around. After thirty or so minutes of attempting to jimmy the door open with the bar, he righted himself, tossed the crowbar aside, and walked back our way to where we were both spectating. Hard way it is, he said, drawing a single stick of dynamite from his vest 
pocket before lighting it and tossing it over his shoulder onto the stone floor. Short fuse, he said as he sped past us, diving behind a fallen tree. Sandy and I exchanged a shocked glance before darting for cover after him, moments before the explosion rocked the forest. Fuck, Terry! My fucking ears! I barely heard Sandy over the persistent and invasive ringing as she yelled by my side. I was the first to peer into the void. In the midst of trying to stand and regain my balance, I caught a glimpse into the inky black of the chasm that the door had been holding at bay. I slowly began to creep towards the opening, inch by inch. Then Terry bolted past me, sliding to a stop just outside the entrance. Yes! We're in, baby! He exclaimed once he had made sure that the passage was actually clear enough to enter. Me and Sandy followed behind, craning our necks to peek inside. Well, let's get to it, Terry said, clapping his hands together and taking the first real step inside the opening. We followed, but cautiously, switching on our lights as we made our way in. The entrance was a small hallway that opened to a much larger room, the walls of which were covered top to bottom in more carvings, but these were untouched and of meticulous detail. As we all gazed around the stone cavern, our attention was all brought together, on a large sphere towards the middle of the room. As we all gathered around, Sandy was the first to notice. Back? Terry? It's... It's a goddamn globe. Neither of us argued. A few steps closer and a quick swipe to remove centuries of dust confirmed it beyond any shadow of doubt. And not only was it a globe, it was accurate. Not even kind of accurate, or pretty accurate. N no, not even very accurate. It was perfect. We all shivered as a chill went down our spines. The globe showed absolute clarity, each and every curve of every last landmass from continents to islands. And it was tilted on its axis exactly as it should have been which made me wonder what the small golden dots placed at random locations across it represented. This thing was so right, it just had to be wrong. Nothing like this could be here, and we all knew it. Terry, I said, not knowing why or what I wanted the response to be. I don't know, Beck, he answered quietly. Let's look around some more. Sandy suggested after a minute or two. Maybe someone came here and put that there. If we look around, we might find some signs of other people before us. I'm pretty sure this whole thing is a sign of people before us, Terry said, looking around at the various carvings on the walls. But okay, let's see what we find, he added, giving the globe a soft spin. Wait, I said, grabbing his wrist to prevent him from walking away. What is this supposed to be? I asked, pointing at an unfamiliar shape some distance offshore to the right of the South American landmass. There isn't anything between there, Terry said, looking back at me. Look! I said, tapping my finger at the area in the globe. He leaned in, licking his thumb and wiping away the dark spot, checking to see if it would come off. Then quietly took a few steps away from the globe and dropped to his knees bringing his balled-up fists over his head before shouting in excitement. Five minutes down here, and we've already found evidence of Atlantis! His yell echoed off the walls as he jumped back to his feet and grabbed us both by the shoulder. Start taking as many pictures as you can, guys. We just went down in history, he instructed, his grin wider than ever before. As we studied and photographed the room, we came across several other openings in the back which led to an expanse of interweaving halls and rooms. We stepped inside each one for a moment to decide which to explore first. Then we agreed to step outside for a minute, as the air had begun to feel stuffy and we were all beginning to breathe a bit heavy. As we approached the entrance, we noticed that the light that once bled in from the surface at the end of the hall was no longer there. Thinking something might have fallen over the opening, we all ran to investigate. But the hall that was barely ten meters when we had entered was now much longer. We doubled back, 
being under the impression that there must have been a second passage we were taken by mistake. Once we got back to the main room, we were able to confirm that there was only one hall on that side, which made no sense. Stone doesn't just suddenly change in an instant like that. We tried to think of some logical explanation for it, but couldn't. I think we're going to have to try one of the back pathways, Terry suggested. I know it doesn't sound great, but we're definitely not leaving that way. Maybe there's another exit at the end of one. After a bit of pointless arguing, we decided on the middle of the five separate hallways and set out into the tunnel. We checked the rooms we passed as we made our way through the winding corridors. Many of them showed snapshots of daily life, abandoned in an instant and left to time. Cups sitting on tables, unmade beds remarkably similar to what we use today. Some plates were even found with scant remains of ancient food still on them. The entire place started to look like a functioning underground city, deliberately hidden away from the outside world. Where other cultures of the time and area were known for pyramids and other proud displays of architecture, these people chose for some reason to hide underground. After a long period of walking through the tunnels, we happened across a staircase that led to a lower level. Having to choose between retracing our steps all the way to the entryway, or continuing along the path only ahead of us, we descended the steps. They opened into a large round chamber, full of stone tables in the middle, and shelves along the walls. Objects covered in dust adorned many of them, as we shone our lights around the new room. What do you think this place is? Sandy asked. A storage room, maybe? Maybe. I replied, walking over to the nearest wall to inspect the pictographs. On closer inspection, we determined that they were newer carvings, on top of the old ones that had once been. The wall had been smoothed over and re-carved. The main room seemed to be more artistic and meticulous. But in here, they devolved into something crude and hurried. More so, it seemed, the purpose of which was to convey information, rather than abstract beauty. They depicted people crafting the tunnels and made deliberate effort to communicate the importance of the tools they used. Tools which looked almost mechanical in nature, not simple hand tools of metal, which still wouldn't be possible for the time. The people of this area didn't even know how to make ceramic around this period. But these were looking like they were actual power tools. Furthermore, the carvings demonstrated that the source of the tools seemed to be some mysterious ingots from the entrance. They go on to appear to tell that this metal was very finite or perhaps expensive, and they began to attempt to recreate it for themselves. To great failure, it would seem. One man can be seen showing another a picture with the unknown island we saw before on the globe then another with the island no longer there. The final pictograph shows what we interpreted as the metal in some kind of laboratory, liquefying and seeping through the floor onto the occupants on the level below, who in turn were now being shown to either be deformed in the face and attacking and biting each other, or lying in pieces on the floor as a liquid flowed over them. Then we saw the final images of the series. In stark contrast and impeccable detail, a face. Human, but also not. It shows undeniable similarity to the deformities from the previous image, but with infinitely greater detail. The face looked old and decrepit. The mouth hung wide with sharp piranha-like teeth in place of incisors. The tongue flopped far out from the mouth, and was covered in thin spines that seemed to open like a blooming flower. What the hell? Terry said as he inspected the almost portrait like stone. We need to go, Sandy said, pushing her way past him. Terry ran back to the beginning of the series, to take pictures before joining us. As we waited... We suddenly heard his camera clatter to the ground, shortly followed by him screaming in agony. Sandy was right behind me as we ran to his aid as fast as we could. Terry! 
I yelled as we got close enough to see him kneeling, holding a bleeding hand. Are you okay? What? Oh. Yeah. I dropped my camera and when I reached down to get it, I had to scratch my hand on a little rock or something. I'm fine. He explained. Then why the hell did you scream? You scared the shit out of both of us. Suddenly I scolded. Oh. I broke my fucking camera lens, he said, holding up his camera to show us the broken lens. We could kill him and say it was an accident. It could be our secret, Sandy joked, breathing heavily as she searched through my backpack for a medical kit. This essentially looks kind of bad, Terry, I told him as I applied some antibacterial ointment and wrapped a large bandage around his hand. It's pretty deep and really long. You're gonna need some stitches when we get out. We'll worry about that later. He dismissed, getting to his feet. I wiped a patch of dust off of a random object sitting on one of the shelves next to us. I could now tell it was metallic underneath. I began to clear more and more off the thing's surface until the entire structure could be seen. Terry, what does this thing look like to you? I asked, motioning for him to come over. Circular saw, he said plainly, taking one quick look at it. If I didn't know better... I'd say that's a circular saw. He reached up with his non-bandaged hand and picked it up from the resting place. I mean, it has two handles? A disc with teeth? Even, he said, twitching a place on one of the handles, causing the disc to come to life. The blade almost made no sound itself, not until the alarm caused Terry to drop it, which at some point, the spinning teeth struck the floor and made an awful racket. Fuck, that scared me! Terry yelled, holding his hands up over his head. Everyone okay? Yeah, we're fine. But what was that? Terry asked him. It's definitely a saw, but how the hell does it still work? Terry said more to himself than us as he reached down to pick it back up. But look, this doesn't make sense. Or I mean, it makes even less sense than it should. The teeth aren't even damaged. And I can't make out any parts or means of attachment. Just like it was made to last forever. Then, activating the spinning blade again, he held it against the stone shelf it sat on. The whirring teeth tore a large gash deep into the rock as the machine chewed deeper and deeper, until he stopped and looked at the thing again, then back to us. Then we all began to dust off and photograph as many of the various objects as possible. Some looked familiar, like drills and grinders and jackhammers. Others looked almost alien in their possible utility. Try to find something small to stuff in your bag so we have something when we get out, Terry instructed us. I found a finely pointed tool that I assumed was once used to carve the images into the walls and slid it into the side of my backpack. After that, we all converged at the opposite end of the room, where another opening led to yet another hallway. But after a moment, we realized that the passage was blocked by another large stone slab, though this one was different than the previous one, which blocked the opening. The new slab before us was completely plain, and looked to have been hastily made, and by the looks of it, was not an original part of the architecture. The carvings running down the hall all stopped abruptly at the slab. Pictures of people, objects, and animals would either end at the stone obstruction or emerge from behind it. But at the same time, there were absolutely no gaps between the slab and the wall. It hooked the contours of the deeply carved pictograph so perfectly, it almost had to be airtight. By this point, we were already short of breath, and this did nothing to improve our breathing. What do we do now? Turn around? Sandy asked, inspecting the wall for a way through. Maybe not, Terry said, walking up next to us, holding his injured hand. The bandaging, now saturated, had begun to drip blood onto the dusty floor. Jeez, Terry, are you okay? I asked. Yeah, yeah. It was throbbing for a bit, but it started to go numb now. Anyway, I've still got some explosives in my bag, he said shrugging off the backpack onto the ground. Here, reach in there and get some sticks out with a longer fuse. He instructed as he used his good hand to unzip it. Okay, now what? I asked. 
Just set it down in front of the thingy and get around the corner of the room. So I did as I was told and retreated back into the tool room, watching him light the dynamite from around the corner. As he joined us in the room, I heard him counting under his breath. Five Mississippi. Four Mississippi. Three Mississippi. Before he took shelter around the corner, covering his ears. Sandy and I barely got our own ears covered before the explosion shook the floor. Once the dust settled, we were able to see that the dynamite didn't do any notable damage to the stone wall. Huh. Okay then. Maybe that way, Terry said, shrugging off his backpack once again. Reach in and pull out one of those grey blocks. What is this? I asked, doing as he said. C4, spicy brick, boom cheese, he answered. Now there should be a small electrical device in the little pocket. That's the detonator. I need you to get that out and stick the first set of positive and negative wires into the brick, and the other two into the second brick. Okay, got it, I said once I finished his instructions. Good, now turn the device on and hit time set. Then once the numbers flash all zero, run the time to 15 seconds. Once you do that, you can go take cover, and I'll start the clock. Once I finished, I did as he said and made my way back to behind the wall. Then shortly after he followed, counting once again. Seven Mississippi, six Mississippi, a little farther back. Four Mississippi, three Mississippi, he said, pushing us back away from the opening and covering us with his body. The next explosion I could feel in my chest as it blew a large plume of dust and rubble out from the hallway. Woo! Well, that'll clear your sinuses! Terry said, slowly making his way back to the hall. Give it a second, he said, holding his hand up to stop us following. Wait and see if anything got knocked loose and hasn't fell yet. After waiting for a minute or two and was sure that it was safe, we were able to pass through the hole in the slab, which was considerably thicker than we had imagined. Once we crossed the barrier, the change in the atmosphere was immediately apparent. It was now much harder to catch our breath and the lights seemed not to reach nearly as far into the darkness as they did only moments before. A few steps in, we began to notice small streams of sickly yellow liquid dropping from the walls and puddling on the floor. I shone my light on one of the thin streams as I leaned in closer for a look. Something seemed to glimmer underneath the putrid yellow, as it dripped in an almost pulse-like way down the walls. Mesmerized, I reached out a single finger towards the fluid. Every ounce of common sense in my body says to absolutely not touch that shit. Terry said a few centimeters away from my ear, making me jump in fright. Come on, let's get moving, he said, the labor in his breath now even more noticeable. We walked on for hours in the smothering darkness. The air felt thick and hot, but sparse of oxygen, as if breathing through a blanket. The sickly yellow fluid became more and more common as well. We began having to actively avoid brushing across it or stepping in it the farther we went. Then we saw the first one. Terry? Sandy? What the hell is that? I asked with a quaking voice, hardly needing to hear the answer. That's a body, Terry said slowly creeping up next to it. We all gathered around to investigate. It looked all wrong. Emaciated, but not mummified. But it was so old, it would have decayed to bones by now, if not for that. But it looked... not fresh, but not nearly old enough. Any clothing it might have once worn had been rotted away, with nothing but a few stone and metal buttons left to be recognized. What the hell? Terry said as he squatted down for a closer look. It was at that moment I noticed that the blood dripping from his hand hit the floor next to the puddle of the yellow fluid. No sooner did it hit the floor did it very rapidly begin to be drawn towards the puddle. All of it. Not a single trace of blood was left, but the dust trail it made as it moved. It touched the fluid and instantly diffused as though it was never there. Guys? Guys! I yelled, trying to get their attention. Look! I said, pointing towards the ground as more droplets hit the floor 
and were immediately pulled into and swallowed by the yellow liquid. Okay, that looks a lot like our cue to leave, Sunny insisted. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Terry agreed as we hurried down the path. Hey guys, just before you go, I wanted to suggest a cool documentary that just came out on Animal Educate. If you know me by now, you probably understand that I am a massive wolf lover and wildlife enthusiast. This well-made documentary explores the grey wolf's relationship with man, how it's been unjustly demonised, the possibility of it returning to Britain, and how to overcome the obstacles in the way. It's absolutely free and well worth the watch.